Welcome to the Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. We're inundated with reports from media, governments, think tanks, experts, saying our climate is changing for the worse, and that it's our fault because of CO2 emissions. But despite the apocalyptic predictions about climate, our Earth, our planet, is improving. Why? And why aren't we hearing about it? Is it possible that CO2 is not a pollutant? Rather, that it's a miracle molecule? I think that may be the case, but I'm not sure, so I wanted to bring in two men who do know a lot about it with the CO2 Coalition. Uh, founder is uh, Dr. William Happer, co and chair of the CO2 Coalition, uh, professor emeritus at the Department of Physics at Princeton University, with over 200 published papers and a resume and list of awards that goes on for many hours, but we're going to talk about CO2 instead. And, and Gregory, uh, also joining is Gregory Wrightstone, who's the executive director, who comes at this from a different perspective as an MS in geology, has been involved with the fracking world and uh, knows a lot about how this works out in practice and uh, in the real world. And not that Princeton's not the real world, but you two have worked together to uh, on this thing. So, Will, could you tell me a little bit about the CO2 Coalition, how you pulled it together, and uh, what, what, uh, what's our agenda here? Well, thanks, Bill. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting Greg and me to join you. The CO2 Coalition is something we put together, I think, in 2015. And um, I collected a few friends who, like myself, were worried about the drift uh, in American uh, society toward demonization of CO2. You know, we kept reading about the pollution of the atmosphere by CO2. That worried me because I knew that I exhale two pounds of CO2 a day and every other human being does. So you kind of wonder how is it possible that something that we produce ourselves is a, a pollutant. And so, of course, we knew it wasn't a pollutant at all, but uh, getting that message out was very difficult. Most of the mainstream media, most of the scientific societies had swung over to reinforce the idea that CO2 was a dangerous pollutant and something had to be done immediately. There was a climate emergency. And so we founded this little group and it was uh, very good scientists, economists, engineers. Uh, you probably know Patrick Moore, who was one of the uh, founders of Greenpeace Canada. He was in there with us. Uh, Dick Lindzen, a very distinguished uh, meteorologist, atmospheric physics from MIT was with us. Uh, uh, there, there were a number of very, very good people. Pat, uh, uh, Pat Michaels, uh, who was here in Washington, a climate scientist. And uh, so we really didn't know exactly what we were doing, but we put together this group so and we raised like, a little money. So it sounds like the 97% co consensus is not exactly 97%. sounds like there's a little more than 3% who would disagree <laughs> with... Uh, I think the number is much higher because people are afraid to uh, speak their mind. You know, there's so much social pressure. Well, there's also financial pressure. Yes. As I understand it, if you're a research scientist... If you're on the other side of the climate debate, i.e. The, the, the side that says climate is terrible and right. CO2 is the problem, you can't get funding. That's certainly true. The, and uh, it's a particular problem for young people because they have to have a career. And to make a career in academia, you have to bring in funding. And so if you're in a field that's anywhere related to climate, you almost have to toe the party line that we're dealing with a climate emergency, and I'm helping to uh, make the emergency less threatening. Uh, that's sort of the tone of your public, of your proposals. For example, I remember <laughs> a friend of mine who was a very good uh, ornithologist, and he wanted to study the migration of birds from all the way from the Arctic down to South America. And uh, yeah, it was an interesting question, you know, just physically, how can you store up that much energy as a little bird to make that flight? No one would fund him, you know, it was a good proposal. And then someone said, you know, 
why don't you add effects of climate change on bird migration from the Arctic to Patagonia? And it immediately got funded, you know, at twice the amount he asked. Right? So, <laughs> so, that, so that's the, it's the reality. It's we're the in. reality. Yeah, that's the reality of it. So, Greg, how did you get involved? How did you go? You, you, you made your I was, I was in the energy business early, like you say, doing some of the first groundbreaking research on the, on, on the shale gas revolution. That was in the early 2000s. But then uh, I really transformed beginning in about 2014. Uh, I, I, it was my own personal search for the truth about climate change. I knew as a geologist that some of what we were being told about climate change was wrong. I suspected some other things were wrong, and it was it was my personal search for this truth. So I, 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 going into this, I said, I'm not going to trust anybody. I want to go back and look at the base data and look at it myself. And frankly, what I found angered me. I found that much of what we're being told about climate change is contradicted by the facts, the science, and the data. And that drove me uh, to write my first did you book. Have an, did you have an epiphany? Did it, there was an aha uh, moment where you said there were the scales several, dropped, and, or were you already in a uh, wondering? It was, it was systematic going through yeah. each one of these claims of, of increased droughts, increased flooding, uh, deserts uh, expanding. And, and perhaps it was... It was the, really the greening of the southern Sahara, the Sahel, 200,000 square kilometers of the Sahel, the southernmost Saharas, turning into a lush grassland. Uh, deserts we see are shrinking, and it's because of, believe it or not, warming and more CO2. It's fueling, the CO2 is fueling plant growth, and we see that. The big thing we see is this greening of the earth and extreme uh, growth of vegetation from the near polar regions to the equator. There are more forests in North America. There are more forests in uh, Europe. I mean, what have we gone from like 10% forest in Europe to almost 40% now, the landmass? It's not just, it is forest. We're, we're experiencing reforestation, not deforestation. Right. But we're experiencing the warming means that uh, the tree lines growing, for example, the northern hemisphere is, is moving northward from tundra into it, it's according to dr timothy ball uh, in the last 100 years it's moved 100 kilometers north in canada so you've written your own book uh, and you have a new one coming out your first book was inconvenient facts which yeah. i don't know where you got that yeah. title uh, uh, it, but, uh, it's, it's actually been so very it's facts not truth it's been very very it was just recently again number one bestseller on amazon just last week after after seven years you, you my, have almost five thousand five star likes yeah, it, it's been very popular, uh, uh, been embraced by people diverse as Candace Owens has, has kind of taken me under her wing and promoted my book and what I'm saying. Uh, so I have a lot, of, a lot of people that have been supportive. My, this new book, um, it's exploring the huge benefits of modest warming and more CO2. Uh, the title's a very convenient warming. And what we see, I call it the greatest untold story of the 21st century. And the story is that, again, modest warming and more CO2 were leading to huge increases in benefits to the Earth's ecosystems and uh, to humanity. The human condition is improving because of more warming and more CO2. And it's completely opposite of what you and your listeners are being told. So CO2 is the villain. CO2 has been declared a pollutant by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And when did they declare that a pollutant? Was that 10 years ago? Well, there was a famous court case, Massachusetts versus EPA. You would know this maybe better than I do, Greg. But it, it, yes, it was of the order 10 years ago. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact date. Well, roughly. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. you know, the they developed this perception that it was a political divide too so the typical democrat would say well co2 is a uh, unnecessary evil you know we can get rid of it we can all run electric cars and have windmills and solar to replace all sources of energy and republicans said yes uh, co2 is an evil, but it's a necessary evil. We can't do all these things that the Democrats want to do. And so neither one of those is correct. It's neither a uh, unnecessary evil nor a necessary evil. It's actually beneficial 
to the world that we live in. It's beneficial to life on Earth. Well, we may want to talk about, we've got, the CO2 Coalition has a great website, and it's got charts galore on it, and the charts, we can use words, but the pictures really tell the story, and I, if we could put up the, the chart on uh, how current levels of CO2 are at near, or at record lows, do you, either one of you want to talk about this? Uh, I mean, well, th and this, this is, is not just in the last few hundred years, this yeah. is over millions of years. This is a geological uh, record that you uh, produce by looking at sediments and by analyzing carbonates and isotopes in the sediments, you can infer what the CO2 levels were hundreds of millions of years ago. So this spans 400, 500 million years. And geologists are pretty good at this. And uh, what you see on this chart is that only once in the past during the Permian period 250 million years ago was CO2 as low as it is now. And uh, so we're in a CO2 famine today compared to what the world would really like, what plants would like. And that's why this greening that Greg mentioned is taking place. Plants are finally beginning to get enough CO2 to grow the way they're designed to grow. They've been struggling with low levels now for the last 20, 30 million years. There, there's another chart here which is even more dramatic, which is the 140 million year trend of dangerously decreasing CO2. Yes. And that... Yeah, that, uh, the, the thing that's dramatic about that is you can put plants in a greenhouse and, and take feed them different amounts of CO2. And if you get CO2 levels too low, and typically it's around 150 parts per million, you know, the plants stop growing, they die. So if you look at the CO2 levels in the pre-industrial time, and especially during the last glacial maximum, they were very close to this level of death where they would all have died. So, you know, there, <laughs> if you want to talk about an existential threat, the threat was really having too little CO2, not having too much. We're far, far away from the optimum level, which is much higher. So how did the scientific community I mean, we need to talk about the United Nations, although YouTube will probably tell us that we're disagreeing with the United Nations, and we will. But their models, what is the IPCC, the international, um, what is it? The, the, the Intergovernmental Panel, Panel on Climate Change. And I they think. put out model after model after model, and a lot of the scientists of, of, you know, collaborate with what they're doing. Um, They've locked on to CO2 as the problem, and yet these charts show just the opposite. How do they, how would, if they were here, what would they say? Well, it's hard to know what someone else would say, but th this was really pushed early on by people like the Club of Rome, you know. And if you read the early writings of the Club of Rome, I think one of them said, We met the enemy, it, it is us, you know, it's humanity, and we, we have to somehow find a common enemy for all of mankind. To, that was uh, 1960s. Oppose. Yes, that's right. And your, that's your colleague Patrick Moore, I think, said that he left Greenpeace when it, I think it declared that the real problem were, uh, that the world faced were human beings. Well, that's right. And uh, that's I really think, the Club of Rome, anti-human. Uh, that, 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 that's right. That's right. And so, I mean, it's not all bad if you think about it. The, the argument was that if we can just get humans to fight CO2, they won't fight each other. Then you wouldn't have, you know, war in Palestine or Ukraine because we're all busy fighting CO2. But, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it, it's a, it has some plausibility to it, but you can see it hasn't worked. You know, we've been fighting CO2 as hard as we can and wars are still happening. So we, we might as well be honest about it and try and fix the wars in some other way. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, if we look at it, too, we look at the, the you know, I'm asked this, I, I get asked this on many interviews, is why are they doing this? And basically the question is, why are they lying to us, is the kind of the abrupt question to ask. And, and I, I, I can't answer that, and I don't think Will can. We can speculate. Uh, but that's not our job as scientists to tell you why they're doing it. Will and I can't look inside men's and women's souls to see what their motivation is, but we can... As our role as scientists, we can say, okay, here's what they're telling you, and here's what the science and the facts tell us. And we can dispute that. And that, that's really, 
as I see it, that's our role uh, at the CO2 Coalition, is to provide the science, uh, the facts, uh, to dispute what we're being told. And it's, it, there's a lot to be disputed. This is Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. I'm here with Will Happer and Greg Whitestone, and who are with the CO2 Coalition, who are doing amazing work to uh, prevent overwhelming evidence that CO2 is good for us. And I think before we wander into the agenda of the other side, let's establish exactly why it's good for us. And we've got another chart here I wanted to put up with some photos in it. Uh, with the with the plant that's been grown, I think, by one of your colleagues, or four different plants, with different levels of CO2 injection. Yeah, that's Sherwood Itso, who was an outstanding agricultural scientist in Arizona, and he's showing the growth of uh, a variety of pine at different levels of CO2. And if you look at the picture, you can see the more CO2, the faster the pine trees grow. And that happens for every plant that you try. All plants do much better with more CO2. And the lower, the lower, the one with the shorter plant is about where we are now, about three, 385 parts per million. Yeah, uh, that, he probably uh, started that, was that, that early was measured, on. That was measured at that time. That yeah, was the yeah. CO2 low. And now, and then they ramped it up to 835. Uh, That's about double what we have today. We're around 425 today. And the thing I'll jump in here, uh, it's not that pine trees, although that's important that forestation is occurring, the huge takeaway here, what's it doing to agriculture? What's warming and more CO2 doing to agriculture? And we see it every metric, every single crop we look at, and I capture that uh, in my new book. I look at the top eight crops uh, in the world, and they're just continuing to break records year after year after year, and that's a combination of the warming so bear in mind, if it's warming, we're going to have longer growing seasons. So killing frosts arrive, uh, stop earlier in the spring and arrive later in the fall. You're going to get more plantings. Crops grow better with warm temperatures. And then that's turbocharged by increasing CO2. It's called the CO2 fertilization effect. Uh, so we've got warming turbocharged by more CO2. And we're able to feed the growing population agricultural production is outstripping population growth by a significant amount. Yeah, I would just add that part of the rap against CO2 is that the warming will be dangerous, you know, that I noticed that the head of the United Nations has talked about the era of global boiling, you know, good grief, I mean, I... <laughs> go out and I look at the ocean, I don't see any sign of it boiling. It looks about the same as it did when I was a little kid. But uh, they have tremendously uh, exaggerated the potential of CO2 to cause warming. It will, we think, cause a small amount of warming, but it's very hard to get more than, to predict more than one degree of centigrade of warming if you double CO2. And uh, nevertheless, uh, the official story from the United Nations is that if you double CO2, it will be much larger, three degrees, four degrees, even more. And that's because they've assumed e enormous positive feedbacks on the direct effect of CO2. Almost everyone agrees that the direct effect will not be much more than one degree centigrade. And, and uh, let me say that, you know, so we're talking about huge positive feedbacks on the direct effect of CO2. Almost nothing in nature has positive feedbacks. Almost everything is negative feedbacks in nature. There's even a fancy name for it. It's called Le Chatelier's Principle. And so if you look at most natural phenomena, it ch something changes and then something else changes to try to resist the change and make it smaller. So that's well known in all other natural phenomena, but for some reason it doesn't happen in CO2. Which is, which is why the models don't work, which is... I, the models be, clearly are not working. Because you've got so many variables in the models, you change that, one, it changes everything right. else. That's right. I mean, the Earth, it, it's just incredibly complicated, you know. You've got the fluid system of the atmosphere, you've got the oceans, which cover 70% of the Earth, and uh, in my field of physics, you know, fluids are, are just notorious for being the hardest system to understand. 
you know, it's extremely difficult to predict anything with fluid. It's a problem, for example, when you design nuclear weapons, you know, the fluid flow in a weapon is uh, quite difficult to understand. And it's certainly true for the atmosphere, which is much more complicated than a weapon. And when, when we talk about, this is fascinating, when we talk about what they're telling you, they're, they're telling us we can't allow it to get above 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that's 1.5 degrees, or it'll be baked in, it's all over. They're talking about 1.5 Celsius since 1850, 1800. We've already warmed 1.2 degrees of that 1.5. So what they're warning us about is not 1.5 degrees of increased warming, it's <laughs> three-tenths of a degree centigrade of warming from today. That's half a degree Fahrenheit. If we're sitting in your studio here and it warmed up or cooled down half a degree Fahrenheit, you couldn't tell it. Your thermostat would not trigger on or My off. My wife could tell. <laughs> she might well be able to do that. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're worried about one half a degree Fahrenheit of being dangerous, all you have to do is move 13 miles further north and you'll, your average temperature will fall by that amount. And it's, it's, it's actually ridiculous to think that, that half a degree Fahrenheit change of temperature. We see that between 10 a.m. and noon every day. Well, let's back up and go a little even deeper into some of the wonky realities of this. There's another chart you have in your site that really talks about how the CO2 and its impact even on warming. As, as the numbers go up, CO2 in the atmosphere its warming effect goes down or it flattens out. And it right. would be this chart here. And this is a little, I had a little difficulty figuring out what was happening here. What is happening with this chart? Well, it's, it's a little bit of a wonky uh, chart. I but, like wonk. Uh, Let's go full wonk. <laughs> <laughs> CO2 in the atmosphere is a little bit like a layer of paint around the earth. And, uh, you know, if you paint a bar in red, get a nice red coat of paint. If you put a second coat of paint on of the same paint, it won't look any redder. You know, you say that the, uh, the paint has already saturated the coloring that it gives to the barn, and that's exactly what CO2 is doing now. So at the current levels of CO2, if you double the amount, it almost doesn't matter. It, it only changes the cooling radiation to space by 1% very tiny amount. And that's, that's only radiation. Temperature will change by a quarter of a percent to first order. So it's, it's a nothing effect. So let's run down the list of those things that do matter with climate. CO2 is, is on the list somewhere, but you mentioned oceans. You mentioned, um, I think we've got uh, volcanic activity, clouds, Earth's orbit. The sun. The sun. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> up there. How did we forget about that? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, just here's one I, I want you to explain. The glacial, intraglacial changes. Is that, what yeah. is that? Anyway, it doesn't matter, but there's a list here of well, things. The, the, and, those and big, so, the, the big glacial advances and retreats are driven by uh, these big uh, celestial forces in the Earth's orbit, the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, the wobble. And these things are driven on... Uh, right now on 100,000-year cycles. Uh, the, the effects that we've seen over the last, say, 10,000 years since the end of the last glacial advance are, are being driven by things that, that are probably related to solar fluctuations, although it's not entirely clear that's, that's entirely driving these temperature changes. Uh, but we've seen a number. We've seen over the last 10,000 years, again, since the last glacial advance, we've seen nine other warming periods, very similar to what we see today. Well, let's talk about the glaciers. We've got another chart here. I'm going to make our producer work hard today to get this thing edited, but it's worth it because these tell a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about yeah. the decline in the, 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 the glaciers are melting, the ice caps are melting, the polar bears are going to go away. And yet the trend on the glaciers started long before... Yeah, it, uh, started, it started actually around 1800 is yeah. when glaciers started retreating. We started warming more than 300 years ago, really in the late seven, uh, six, 1600s, early, late 17th century. And so we started warming, but the amount of warming, in order to make glaciers retreat, the amount of, of melt needs to, in the, in the summertime, needs to exceed the accumulation of ice during the wintertime. 
And that point, that, that tipping point occurred around 1800. And so since, since about 1850 to today, uh, glacier retreat and sea level rise that go hand in hand uh, are about the same rate as what we were 150 years ago. Um, and so, yes, we are in a warming trend. In a warming trend, we should see glacial retreat and rising sea level. And uh, actually, if you go to Glacial Bay, Glacier Bay in Alaska, my wife and I traveled there. People point to that. That started retreating in the year 1798. And of the 60 miles of retreat of the glacier, the first 50 miles, so that came before we started adding much CO2 in the middle of the 20th century. So the, the, the point I think you're making, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm enjoying my own romp through your slides. I hope we don't over, overwhelm people with them, but I think here, this slide tells a lot, is that there has been an increase in, in CO2 emissions that's happened after World War II, but not much before then. And to what do you attribute, um, Kenny, do you have this... Uh, uh, to w what do we attribute this increase to? Is this is this man-made? I mean, I, I think we're not saying the answer is yes. Have an effect the answer the answer is is primarily it's man-made, man-driven <clears throat> CO2 emissions, mainly from the burning of fossil fuels. Some small part, maybe six or eight percent, from cement manufacture. Uh, a very small amount from glass gas flaring. But the main contributor, uh, we believe, is is from man man sources, and we're okay with that. Dr. Happer here will tell you that. Uh, we're okay with having a big carbon footprint uh, because CO2 is a beneficial molecule. We call it the miracle molecule. Uh, so more CO2 is better. And so we're drawing the benefits not only from the use of fossil fuels, but also from the emissions. When you burn fossil fuels, for example, methane, you get, what's the product? Heat, water vapor, and CO2. Well, let's define the demon, or the supposed demon. You know, CO2, they, they throw out the word carbon. Carbon, carbon, carbon. Carbon's black, it's coal, it's evil, and, you know, we ought to, we ought to not have carbon. Can we, can you help me out understanding why <laughs> carbon is not the, not well, the villain well, look, and well, CO2 yeah, is not you, the you, you and I are made of carbon, you know. Oh my when gosh. I was a kid, they <laughs> talked about organic chemistry, which meant right. the chemistry of carbon compounds, organic carbon compounds. Right. So carbon is central to life. You can't have life without carbon. And when they talk about carbon pollution, are they talking about you and me? You know, we're walking <laughs> storehouses of carbon. So, I mean, it's well, you, propaganda, you know, it, it's, you know, I just have been rereading Orwell's 1984 the last week or two, and I'm just struck by how similar, you know, much of what we're seeing today is to what was in that book, you know. The, amplify. How, give me, help with that. Well, for example, there was the Ministry of Truth, you know, and they had these slogans, uh, the party slogans, you know, war is peace, uh, uh, ignorance is strength, you know. <laughs> right, Just right. Absolutely absurd slogans. But now we have carbon as a pollutant, you know. It, it goes up there on the building of the Ministry of Truth. But that's the same sort of absurd thing, but everybody believed it. Well, and the only really bad carbon are those people who voted for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe yeah, the, so. The other carbon. Yeah. Uh, Greg, you're going to jump in here. Oh, no, I just I was reminded of uh, whenever he said he was reading uh, George Orwell. It was, I think, a year ago I told him, I said, I'm rereading Atlas Shrugged. And, and Will says, yeah. oh, that's what a coincidence. So am I. I'm reading it in Russian. <laughs> now, who else, who else other than Dr. Happer will be reading Atlas Shrugged? It's difficult enough in English. Who else will be reading it in Russian? Well, I'm actually reading 1984 in Russian, too. But... <laughs> It somehow it sounds more appropriate. Okay. <laughs> well, you've, you've, yeah. <laughs> so the, let's, let's, we, I, I jumped in to do, to talk about what has happened since World War II, but I also wanted to point out that not only the glaciers, not a new, their changes are not a new phenomena based on human activities, but the sea level. Ah, fascinating. And, and we have another chart here which talks about the global sea level since uh, 1800. Well, let's, let's, let's unpack this. So we're being told, aren't we, that the uh, Pacific Islands, the Indian Ocean Islands are at risk for being underwater in the next several decades. All right, well, sea level is rising at about seven inches per century. All right, so let's just say they'll be underwater by 1950. 
We're expecting two inches of sea level rise at the current rate by 19 or by 2050. 2050, me. 2050 yeah. excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, 15,000 years ago, let's just look at the at most at risk island is the Maldives, according to the UN. 15,000 years ago, that island was still just above sea level. In the last 15,000 years, sea level has risen 400 feet. Why are these islands not underwater now? They should be if it's risen 400 feet. The reason is it's a geologic process known as accretion. These islands actually grow as sea level rise. As the storms come in, they wash the shore face. There's gravels and sands that get washed up on the islands. So all of these islands, if you look at them and go, well, why, why aren't they underwater now after 400 feet of sea level rise? And they say, oh, don't worry, but that, that next two inches by 2050 will put them under. <laughs> no, it won't. No, it won't. The same processes are in action today as has been in action for thousands and millions of years. So that means that the, they're being pushed up as well, part of the geological process? No, they're, they're, sure what's they're, happening. they're growing because they're sucking CO2 out of the air and turning it into calcium carbonate uh, because of the coral reefs. They're, that, they're coral islands. And so the coral always grows a, you know, a foot or so beneath the mean sea level. I, I don't know the exact number. But if the sea level rises, it moves up. And then, and then the, uh, but, but for the accretion part of this, mm -hmm. it's these islands like the Maldives and the others are above sea level. And so the corals that are ringing the islands are with the waves pound them into, into sand and gravel. And then a storm, the next hurricane or cyclone come through and it washes this gravel and sand up onto the actual island. So we have a combination of what Will was just talking about with the corals growing uh, and that's why coral reefs uh, have not been inundated either. Uh, they grow uh, easily and quickly to accommodate sea level rise. But they would not have grown at all if there had been no CO2 because the coral would have died. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, all, all life needs CO2. So island, islands uh, depend on living things, uh, coral islands at least. Uh, and um, thank goodness for CO2. They would not have been able to do it without that. Well, you also point out that we've, you mentioned this at the outset, but I think it bears repeating, is that our CO2 levels actually reach dangerously low levels. That's correct, yeah. And we've got a chart here that talks about how it's fallen during the ice ages in the past, what, uh, 400,000 years, and that right, uh, right. we were reaching a point of, uh, of no return. Well, there's pretty good evidence, for example, at the uh, last glacial maximum when CO2 levels got down close to 150, that there was a, uh, a deforestation at, at high altitudes. You know, it's one thing to have 150 parts per million at sea level, but if you go up, you know, 5,000, 10,000 feet, you know, you've got even less CO2, and at that level, at that altitude, many plants just died. And so one of the things you notice in ice cores uh, records of the past temperature is that the glass, last glacial maximum, the ice is extremely dirty. It's full of dust. So it was a time that was constant dust storms. You know, ice was dirty. And that's because the plants that would normally have held the soil in place died from starvation, from not having enough CO2. Well, and, and again, that just repeats the story. You're going to hear this a lot from the two of us today are these benefits of CO2 driving plant growth. And, and repeat again, it, more is better. It just is. Let's look at this. Ah, oh, wonderful chart. Okay. And that's... This uh, is, uh, we're going to talk about grain production breaks records while temperatures and CO2 yeah, that's increase. A, that's a chart from my first book. And what it does is look at the, the main grain crops in the world uh, we compare wheat, rice, coarse grain production of the, this is, this is agricultural production, millions of metric tons. And we compare that there to CO2 uh, going back to the 1960 and temperature. And we're, the increase in agricultural production is marching lockstep in with uh, CO2 and temperature. And we should celebrate that. It's, it's a huge, huge, again, I, it, it may be one of the biggest unreported stories of our century. Yeah, let me just add a, a word or two to that. It, it's really dramatic how much uh, 
uh, wheat yields have gone up. For example, India, they went up by more than a factor of 10 since Indian independence, just, just spectacular. Not all of that is due to CO2. Some of it is due to better use of fertilizer, especially nitrogen fertilizer, which, by the way, is made from fossil fuels. Some of it is uh, better plant varieties, and some of it is irrigation. So a number of factors have contributed, but most careful studies indicate that something of the order of 30 or 40 percent of the increase in yield has been due to more CO2. So it's a very non-trivial positive effect of CO2. You mentioned fertilizer, nitrogen. Right. And nitrogen's now been banned in Sri Lanka. And <clears throat> Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, tell that story because this, and they're now trying well. to do this in, uh, what, Holland? Yes. Um, they're trying to do it in Holland, yeah. And, uh, Canada. All, Ireland, for example, yeah. It's a combination of, of ignorant politicians and... Uh, That's an oxymoron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are a few smart ones, but uh, not, they're, they're not rare. Not too many, not too many. <laughs> yeah. It's what you yeah, have Sri to do. Lanka, it's you what know, you have to do to get elected that weeds out people. Uh, it weeds out uh, a certain type when it makes its way through the process, and that doesn't... Uh -huh. It's not the curious type. It's Anyway, I'm, I'm, that's, yeah, diff that's a different yeah, show. Yeah, no, let, let, let's be <laughs> kind. So there are, are some... <laughs> decent public servants who, okay. who are politicians, and uh, we need to encourage more like that. And, uh, <laughs> so, anyway, I, I, so, so bad-mouthing them here is, is not good. We, we want to get better ones in. <laughs> well, I get the bad mouth. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Fair, uh, fair enough. Yeah. So, but anyway, I, I interrupted you, and I, I do that occasionally. Uh, the nitrogen, the fertilizer, what is, what's, what's happening there? What are the set of beliefs that are causing people to say we shouldn't be using these, uh, these chemicals? Well, there, there are several uh, so-called reasons. One of them is that if you use nitrogen fertilizer, you release a lot of nitrous oxide from the soil because the nitrate that you put into the fertilizer eventually uh, gets reconverted into elemental into, you know, two nitrogens stuck together is the, uh, the way it normally is. But every now and then the soil organisms add an oxygen to that to make an N2O, and that's the potent greenhouse gas. So supposedly the amount of nitrous oxide that comes from nitrogen fertilizer is adding to the demon, you know, CO2 greenhouse effect. and, and uh, Boiling the oceans as the so it's not it, only CO two but N two O N two O you know nitrous oxide it's laughing gas you know it's but, uh, but bear in mind though we're talking about greenhouse gases what we haven't the big elephant in the room here what is the largest greenhouse gas and that's water water right, vapor right. by far um, is the largest most potent or the largest contributor to greenhouse gas warming. Uh, we don't hear anybody advocating for uh, reducing water vapor uh, in the atmosphere. Well, don't don't tempt them. Going <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. to <laughs> <laughs> take a sip before it's banned. Uh, <laughs> well, well, I think we need now to, to to shift towards the what we're up against here. You formed the CO two coalition what seven or eight years ago, and. It's, as it's been growing in its influence and growing in its membership. Tell me about what, yeah, let, what's let, happening. Yeah, let me just say a word or two. I, it uh, started with more enthusiasm than confidence. And uh, bringing Greg aboard has been an enormous uh, benefit to the CO2 coalition. So thank you very much for Greg for all, all you're doing. And uh, but we're continuing to move ahead. I, uh, Greg, for example, has started a direct mailing campaign, and uh, I hope he'll tell you about some of the letters that he gets from people who are so glad there is finally an organization that's speaking for them. I get a lot of direct mail, yeah. a lot, yeah, from all the different groups. And, in fact, this is one of them complaining about, uh, about the direct, direct mail. Anyway, so... <laughs> It always happens. 
So, Greg, your your direct mail is terrific because it it brings out facts about the things we're talking about that I don't read any place else. I mean, there are people yeah. saying they've, the green movement's terrible, blah blah blah, but they don't explain why. We've seen a tremendous outpouring from people across America. Uh, we it, it's been incredible. I was told everyone told me that. Uh, if you were going to do a direct mail campaign, look, you better plan on losing money for the first year or two. We're not. We're seeing such a tremendous outpouring from people that it's just incredible. Uh, a year ago, I'll share, I don't think this is uh, confidential information. We had 334 donors. Today, we've got nearly 8,000. And these are all indiv virtually all individual donors that have responded to what we're doing. They're looking at what we're doing we're the we're the tip, what I, I consider us the tip of the spear when it comes to promoting science and providing the scientific basis to fight back against man-made catastrophic climate change. So they're responding to that. Not only are they responding to that, they're responding to our educational efforts. We've got a new. We'll talk a little bit about that. Maybe not now, but in a little bit. Uh, we've launched an educational effort. We we were scared of what was happening to science education in America. Uh, our, our children are being indoctrinated. They're they're being taught groupthink. Uh, they're they're being told to silence any opposition to this to this man-made catastrophic warming. And we've actually done something about it with our education campaign. So these these people in this direct mail are being we're telling them about that. We're not just talking and complaining about what's wrong with education in America. We're doing something about it with books, with videos and importantly, lesson plans. My my grandchildren are all homeschooled, and my daughter is just raves about the, the lesson plans that have been developed by Dr. Sharon Camp, PhD in analytic chemistry, AP science teacher retired. She's still an AP reader. We have scientists that are developing the books, the videos, and importantly, lesson plans. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get this in front, we're getting in front of charter schools, the public schools, aren't quite receptive, uh, but we're providing science facts and data about what children need to know in an entertaining way with using manga uh, and anime style. Uh, well, people are hungry for the facts and the truth, and we're not being given that by any of the mainstream media. I'm sure when we finish the show, YouTube will put a content label on it saying that it doesn't purport with what the United Nations is saying about everything. Yeah being caused by man-made uh, global warming and that CO2 is the central villain. People have intuitive sense that that's not the case, but nobody's given us the arguments until you guys came along mm -hmm. to prove it. I'm so, I'm so proud of what we've done. We've, we've increased, we have a membership base. That's, uh, the, the, this is the volunteer base we have. We've increased, increased from 45 to a little over 150, 150 members. These are scientists, mostly PhDs. We just brought... Uh, Dr. John Clauser under our board. Who is that? He's the current Nobel laureate in physics uh, onto our board. This is the kind of people that we're bringing on the cl uh, with, the, with this kind of clout and scientific background. Uh, so we again, we're I look at us as being the tip of the spear in providing that scientific. Well, well I'm with you in this cause, but as you can as you can tell, but we're up against a lot of forces that want to per 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 uh, perpetuate really the lie that CO2 is a villain. You gave a great talk at Heartland Institute a bit ago, and you talked about the noble lie right. in Plato. I think it's time for some philosophy. How did this... Uh, talk about the noble lie. Well, we touched on that briefly when we talked about the Club of Rome and the need for a common enemy. And so that's essentially a noble lie because CO2 really is not an enemy at all. And... Um, but if you read Plato's Republic, uh, there is a chapter which uh, talks about the so-called noble lie. You, you, put, you uh, develop this lie, basically a myth, which uh, supports something that you want to do, you know, for example, uh, to maintain control for some oligarchy or some dictator or to promote some religious cause. And, uh, you can see that uh, part of the Republic, it, it's, it's a very awkward sort of uh, narrative that you read. I've wondered whether Plato really believed in it or not, 
but uh, it's worth looking at. Uh, most people have never seen it. But then there are uh, lots of other motives. Uh, that's one thing that's so hard about pushing back against this because people are driven by many different motives. Uh, there's the noble lie. Maybe it's noble. I think any, I don't think any lie is noble, but that's what they call it. Then there's the political lies just to get control. And, you know, an emergency has always been good. You know, this famous Mencken uh, quote that the whole uh, uh, rationale of... Uh, I wrote this one down. Yeah. The whole purpose of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed. Right. And eager to be led to safety. <laughs> right. You know, where is Minken when we need I know. him? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who have you? <laughs> yeah. yeah fear, is a, fear is a great motivator. Yeah. And they're using it effectively. Well, yeah, yeah that seems to be the agenda. And of course, yeah. greed is another big motivator. Yeah. And you look at the, was it Inflation Reduction Act? That was basically a two, one or $2 trillion Green New Deal. Right. Why? Why would we? It fed, it fed all the Democrat uh, and other on both sides of the aisle uh, yeah. coffers with lots of subsidies. Why yeah. would we, as a people, voluntarily agree to have our freedoms restricted like they're talking about? What are they trying to do? They're trying to tell us what car to drive, uh, what washing machine to buy, uh, ban use of natural gas in our homes for heating. Uh, everything from the faucets and your and your showers, they're trying to control everything. Why would we voluntarily do that? The only reason would be if there's actually this existential threat that's going to be leading to, to horrific consequences. We just don't see it. There's no evidence of that happening. And so they use this, uh, what Michael Crichton called a climate of fear, is what they're, was what they're Which promoting. Which is a terrific book. It, it is, and it's a great title. Uh, he beat me to it, but uh, it was. <laughs> Yours a, are pretty good. <laughs> they are, but, no, but it was a, it was a climate of fear that they're promoting for us, for the population to grasp onto these. I, well, let me just give you a personal example. I, we bought a home in Florida three years ago. Our we had an average monthly electricity cost of one hundred and forty nine dollars a month. This summer it's five hundred dollars a month. That's wow. what it's gone. It's incredible. More than three, more than three times. Our electricity use has is, is, is only gone up. It has increased a little bit, but not that much. Yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got a house full of uh, family living in my home, but I'll have to get, that, that's another story for a different day. But, but that's what, 149 to over four, $500. Who can afford that? Very few people can. And that's what's coming to everybody in America. That's what's coming. Uh, punishingly high. Uh, electricity costs, punishingly high gasoline prices that we're seeing. Uh, and it's all by design. They told us what they were going to do, and they're doing it. Well, I believe things now that I didn't believe 10 years ago before I started wandering into this policy and this political and these these, these uh, economic, macroeconomic issues. And you come to believe that there are people who stand to benefit from this control, from this fear, and it seems to start in places like Davos, World Economic Forum. I mean, they're pushing this uh, uh, climate agenda, you know, full speed ahead. And uh, it looks like, uh, you know, it looks like a mechanism for control. Of course, it's a mechanism for control. And, uh, it's so far working. But uh, our, we hope we can stop that before too much damage is done. It will eventually stop. You mentioned Sri Lanka, where they banned nitrogen fertilizer, that corrected <laughs> itself after two or three years because the rice crop failed, the tea crop failed, you know, there were riots in Columba, you know, the presidential palace was stormed and the president was evacuated by helicopter before they were able to hang him. And so the same thing will happen in our country eventually. But, but, but why should we let it go so far? We should stop it before it gets out of control. But just to drive home the point, though, yeah. the elites in Sri Lanka were acting at the uh, under the instructions of, of consultants and other people from World Economic Forum. They right. they bought into the into the, the United Nations and World right. Economic World uh, Bank, yeah. recommendation and the World Bank. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they believed that they bought into this lie that. Uh, modern agriculture on a grand scale could be could be fertilized using bone meal and and uh, uh, dung and 
Uh, didn't we try manure. that a couple thousand years yeah, ago work, and it didn't yeah. really? It, it works okay on a backyard basis. <laughs> and if you've got, so I'm, I like organic farming. I, I have a small uh, organic uh, plots in my backyard. You can do it on that scale, but not, not on a scale to feed the, not on a scale to feed, feed the globe and the planet. Well, I have a backyard garden and I have a compost pile, but I still buy a sack of 10, 10, 10 fertilizer every spring <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and put it all. And it works. It works. It works. It works. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about where we go from here. We've got just a couple of minutes left. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got this started. We've got to keep the ball rolling. How do you how do you bring the word to a lot more people about this truth? You've mentioned the education. I mean, what else do we need to do politically? Well, we need, we're trying to educate, uh, part of our role is educating those in, on Capitol Hill. Uh, we, we stay out of the politics, but we believe part of this is, is to bring the science, the facts, and the data to them. We did that by, I uh, gave you a publication here, Virginia and Climate Change. Uh, we're doing this on a state and regional basis. Uh, we did that to support Governor Youngkin's proposal to get out of the uh, harmful re regional greenhouse gas initiative. We wanted to give him the ammunition uh, to, to pull out of that and pull out of the ECS here in Virginia. Uh, we did the same in Pennsylvania, and we've got others, other of these state and regional reports. We just completed one on uh, climate change in the Midwest. Uh, the subtitle is Life in America's Breadbasket is Good and Getting Better. And that's, we see that repeated time and time again. So that's what our role here is the science. Uh, but we're, we're, our outreach has increased tremendously. Uh, I did nearly 300 interviews in the last 12 months. And so we're, 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 we're reaching millions and millions of people. I think you need to start with the Republicans primarily because they're all light green. I mean, they tend to buy the moral goodness of of. Uh, and they, they've claimed they've claimed the higher higher moral ground. We need you need to claim the higher moral ground, and that what you're doing is good for people, and what the anti CO two people are doing is bad for human is exactly. humanity. We need to, we need to get that out as a clarion call. We do. That's a big problem because you see what happened in the <coughs> United Kingdom when the uh, Conservative Party, the Tories, you know, picked up climate as uh, one of their issues. And so they've really made a mess of Britain, and uh, they don't really know how to get out of it. I'm sorry, they picked now. it up that they were. Wh 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 which side were they on? Did they they are 100 percent green. You know, save the planet. You the know, Tories are going green, and it, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good luck yeah. with that. And so the worry, of, and I think you alluded to it, is that the uh, Republican Party in the United States may go the same direction, and it's it's that's a my bad concern. Mistake. You know, they, it will not increase the number of votes. And, uh, and the Tories are seeing that in Britain, they're probably going to lose the next election, and, uh, and to a large extent because of their net zero. Not, not that that will help poor British, uh, you know, because the Labour Party will be just as bad. Well, the point that I, I, I think we need to hit over and over again, we need to make the moral case. And I think you've done that, and you're doing it with your website, and we're arming people with facts. But the fact that CO2 has been good, warming has been good, it makes people live longer, happier, increases food production. Siberia, which was a, you know, sort of a joke, not a bad joke really, but you get sent to Siberia. Siberia may be green and filled with forests <laughs> if this continues, yeah. and how bad would that be? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. true, the true horror will be when the next cold period comes, because we look back over the last 5,000 years of, of human history, the warm periods have been hugely beneficial to humanity and the cold periods have been horrific. Uh, we are going to start cooling at some point and when that happens, it, will be, it won't be pleasant because we, we've seen what happened over the last several uh, thousand years when it did get cold. We had crop failure, pestilence, mass depopulation. Uh, it, it won't be as bad the next time because we're not moving food around with ox cart and we've got uh, refrigeration, but Crop failure will probably be part of this when, when it starts cooling down again. Yeah, Bill, I think you're right about the moral high ground that w what's being done now with uh, the war on CO2 is fundamentally immoral. And uh, 
it's also a war on fossil fuels. That they're a little bit different, CO2 and fossil fuels, but they're closely related. And Alec Epstein is a young uh, philosopher who has uh, written some books about the moral case for fossil fuels. And uh, so from a philo philosophical point of view, he makes a very good case that uh, the moral high ground is our side of this argument because you, you really can't find any harm that's been done from fossil fuels. We're not focusing on fossil fuels as, as much as we are on CO2, but, you know, of course they're, they're, they're joined at the hip. Well, we will, we will continue. Uh, I'm uh, in, in this fight. I hope we're, we're, we're going to launch a movement maybe. Sounds like you're already doing, but I hope this show helps, helps bring some people to your cause. Where do we find you? Uh, CO2coalition.org, CO2coalition.org uh, for the CO2 Coalition website. Uh, the new book that I have launching shortly is convenientwarming.com, and it's uh, uh, looking forward to having the launch of that hopefully in the next uh, week to 10 days. Oh, that's great. Well, so it sounds like we need to have you back to talk about what's in the book. Or we... If you insist. Okay, I, I may insist. <laughs> Dr. Happer, that's great. It's an honor to have you here. I mean, I, Thank you, I, I Bill, gave for short shrift to your incredible air resume. Issues. Yeah, and that's and uh, so I hope you all have enjoyed the enjoyed this. Uh, maybe not enjoyed all the things we're saying, but at least you know the truth now about CO2, and you know the truth about uh, warming and its beneficial effects. And uh, if you like this content, if you like the point of view we're uh, sharing here, please subscribe if you haven't already done, have not already done so like the show. And if you have friends who are like-minded, uh, ask them to subscribe and, and also like the show. Uh, as, as always, we'll be back with uh, similar content where we get into complicated things and try to make clear what's at stake for all of us. So anyway, thanks for joining. <laughs>